And then now he just left a couple of weeks ago and it's quiet and I'm going through all of the things, but my parents, um, who I, are, were, were actually pretty self-sufficient, right? But I definitely noticed like the changes in memory loss, right? And, and so them just naturally forgetting things or, um, you know, my dad, my dad passed away a couple of years ago, but as he was, um, I don't want to say being forced to retire, but he was being forced to slow down. He was a, an accountant and he just kept, he kept on working. He was like, the day I stop working is the day I leave. Like I'm working till the end, which we understood, but it was hard to watch because of the declines as well. Yeah. Right. And you know, for some of us, we're like trying to take the keys away from our parents because we don't want them to hurt themselves. It's, it's just, it's, it's a lot of moving pieces. And Welcome, everybody, back to another exciting show of the About That Wallet podcast, where we help you build strong financial habits so that you can have the confidence in spending money, making money, and talking about money. But today, I have the awesome opportunity to bring on somebody who is going to be talking about the sandwich generation. And what do I mean by the sandwich generation? That is the aging population and generation of young adults that are struggling to achieve financial independence. And with the burdens and responsibilities of aging Americans are increasing. So nearly 47% of adults uh, in their 40s and 50s have a percentage, I mean, has a parent that is age 65 and older. And they're also raising young children or financially supporting a grown child 18 or older. Um, and also they supporting their parents at the same time. So this is something that we're going to be diving into. And I do not want to hold it up any much further because we have an awesome psychotherapist uh, who is the owner of the Hope Psychotherapy. And her name is Danielle Boucre. How are you doing today, Danielle? I'm good. Thanks for having me. So... I know we just talked, like I just mentioned about the sandwich generation, but you've been in the game for quite a while. And you've also a psychotherapist that's licensed in Maryland, D.C., Virginia, Massachusetts, North Carolina, Florida, and Georgia. Like, do you have to take like different tests to kind of get to all these different places or they (laughs) kind of like inherit it? Like, what's the deal with that? One test, lots of continuing education. That's what it means. But yes. (laughs) And you also specialize in like couples therapy as well as single uh, individual therapy as well, correct? I do. I do. Early in my career, I was trained with uh, the Gottman Institute, which is a, a premier research institute for uh, couples work. And I've just fallen in love with working with my couples. So I love it. Yeah. And what I want to bring you on is because a lot of us are aging up to our 40s and people who are listening to this episode, or actually to this whole show, are roughly around that 35 to 45 range. So some of these people are approaching 40, which mm-hmm. is that, you know, right at the top of the sandwich generation or the beginning parts of that sandwich generation. Um, and we're going through a, a lot emotionally. What is something that we should kind of look into to kind of build a strong emotional relationship with ourselves? Yeah, well, you know, it it is a rough time and it's it's a time that not a lot of us are talking about openly. Right? Um, you know, I love the the coin term sandwich generation, but owning it is really much more difficult <laughs> than it would seem. You kind of when you're approaching it, you feel like you're the only one going through it. Right? So a lot of us talk about empty nesting. Mm-hmm. Right? And that's obvious because our lives are revolved around our children. And then, you know, we lose that and it takes a lot of time and energy to kind of get caught up. But at the same time, for most of us, we're noticing like we're going home to visit our parents and we're like, uh, something's off. Yeah. Right. Or or my mom keeps repeating the same stories or, you know, it's it's the little things that we kind of notice are off. And before we know it, we're full blown trying to also take care of them while we're trying to uh, launch our children. So it's a lot. It's a very heavy time. Yeah. Cause you know, we talked offline and you were talking about like, you finally got rid of, not got rid of, but the, <laughs> <laughs> the, 
they graduated out of the nest. Yes. Uh, but also, um, how are you dealing with like your parents during that time frame? Were you taking care of them? Were they um, living with you? How did that conversation yeah. happen? No, my parents, my parents are never lived with me. Um, they're in Florida and I'm up north, but um, it as so like we said, like I have three kids and they're, they're now 25, 23 and 19. Mm. But since my 25 year old was about 17, right. It started becoming real that like my household was going to shift. Mm. Right. And we, we sent her off to college and indeed it did shift because now I only have two at home and then I have another one that, you know, is grown, not grown like off in the middle of Maine somewhere, like doing her Mm. thing. Um, and so it's it's a shift. And then two to three years later, I had another shift where now I have only one child at home. Um, and then now he just left a couple of weeks ago and it's quiet and I'm going through all of the things. But my parents, um, who I, are, were, were actually pretty self-sufficient, right? But I definitely noticed like the changes in memory loss, right? And, and so them just naturally forgetting things or, um, you know, my dad, my dad passed away a couple of years ago, but as he was, um, I don't want to say being forced to retire, but he was being forced to slow down. He was yeah. a, an accountant and he just kept, he kept on working. He was like, the day I stop working is the day I leave. Like I'm working till the end, which we understood, but it was hard to watch because of the declines as well. Yeah. Right. And, you know, for some of us, we're like trying to take the keys away from our parents because we don't want them to hurt themselves. It's it's just it's it's a lot of moving pieces. And so much I think this is the hardest part is that so much we can't control. Right. We've just got to be, gotta be yeah, flexible because yeah, we always want to control not just the situation, but also to make sure that our parents are doing OK. Yeah. 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 It's it's important, but we we actually get the skills for those of us that were are sandwiching, right? When our kids are growing up, right? In order to have a healthy relationship with them as they're trying to gain their independence, it's really important that we kind of loosen the reins a little bit, mm. right? So that a kid at eight, nine, ten, when we're controlling all of the things and all of the activity at 13, 14, 15, they don't really want us to control anything. So we try and hold on to a little, as much as we can. Right. And at 16, 17, we actually have to let go of control. Otherwise they won't launch. (laughs) Like it's just, it's, it's inevitable. We have to let go. And you kind of practice that with your parents as well. Right. They actually have the independence. They like raised you. So they know how to do it. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. And then suddenly you're, you're trying to control what they do, where they go, what they're able to do. And they're resisting. It's kind of like that, those horrible teenage years when you're raising your kids, it's, it mirrors it completely. So if, if we're able to heal the wounds with our parents and all the layers that come with those and really see them as somebody who is losing agency instead of gaining agency, right? And have that empathy for them. It's so much easier said than done. Yes. <laughs> it's really hard to to do that, but with patience and love, like that's that's what you have to hold on to as opposed to holding on to the sense of like control. Say on the emotional side of the house, because for some people who are married and they are in this transition where they have the father and mother-in-law on both sides and say which one set which set is older and do you guys have that conversation as a married couple to say like hey if my mom or dad are going through this process what do we do do we have them move in with us or do we have them go into a home or do we buy a what they call them a aud like a development in the back of the house so that they can just stay in you know right has those conversations come up uh in your practice and like how did they manage or what guidance would you give somebody yeah of of course they've come up but I, i think some of it is an understanding of the value of family like in your in your immediate family like 
how do we value family members, right? And having the t- the talks about like what what if this happens because we have no idea how our parents are actually going to age, mm-hmm. right? Whether they're going to have all of their you know their wits about them or they're not. That whether physically whether they're going to decline or not, we don't know. There's so much unknown, which comes with so much anxiety. So from a couple's perspective, right? It's about leaning on each other and being transparent and talking, talking, talking. I can't can't emphasize the importance of a support system when you're going through this and a partner is the best form of of a healthy support system because you're kind of experiencing the same stuff. But yeah, I mean, you can do the earlier you start talking about it, the better. Okay. So like when they dating or like when they engage? Well, I think in in any healthy relationship, family is a factor. Gotcha. Right. So so you're you're constantly talking about family and the role that family plays in your life and how you want family to show up for you in your life as a couple. So even when you're dating or engaged or getting married, Family is something that you deal with on a regular basis, okay. right? And so a lot of it depends also on how your parents, for for example, show up for you as you're growing your family and how you're as you're getting older and how connected they are. But at the end of the day, even when they start the decline, whether you're super close or you're even estranged, they're still your parents. You still hold some sense of responsibility to um to help them through their journey okay because i'm i'm thinking of how it also like a lot of people say you know what you're just getting in the home i'm not going to deal with this i'm putting you up in the home no matter what that's real you this is (laughs) i can't take it you know yes um and then the other siblings if you have any how does that work yeah right a lot of time that causes strain in a family like I, I, I have a client whose siblings just aren't showing up. They're just depending on her mm-hmm. um, to do all the things, which is really, it's tough from her perspective, right? And everything that she's got to handle and, and lead. But it's also like, okay, once this journey is over with her parents, it also then affects, has a long-term effect on the relationships with the siblings, Yeah. right? Because there's some resentment there. So it's, oh, and it's then an wait emotional till the, time. And then wait till the will comes out. I'm like <laughs> Facts. For right. real. Yes. Because um, I had a client, not a client, I had a guest on the show who was going through that process in the estate planning. And the parent did not relay the information to all the children, only to two of the three. So when time happens, it's like that third one was like, well, you know, I want a third of the, I want to cut too, because I was, even though I'm the child, they weren't part of the process of helping out the parents and stuff like that. So it's like those type of conversations, like how do you still emotionally show up for the rest of your family? Like during that process, or so you just set like boundaries, like healthy boundaries. How can we set those? Yeah. yeah. I mean, healthy boundaries are oh, boundary setting. I think for most humans is hard. Right. Because sometimes there comes like it's associated with guilt. Like, can I really ask for what I need? Answer is always yes. You can always ask for what you need. Um, But there's some guilt that comes along with that sometimes. But it's really important that everybody knows how to treat one another and what you expect and what you need. And that's all boundary setting is really like training or treating, (laughs) telling people how you want to be treated. but you know, you talked earlier about decisions like to do we put mom or dad in a home? Do we have them move in with one of us? Like those are big decisions to make and life altering decisions to make, right? So it's important that the communication is open and honest and transparent between those making those kinds of decisions, right? Without criticism, without anybody getting defensive. Like, and those are the healthy communication tips that are so important to get you through these tougher conversations. Yeah. And with the, especially in the black community, I mean, we don't talk about mental health enough. So what is it that you think we can kind of start doing to kind of open up that communication? 
Well, I think the one thing is to be honest and transparent about the way you're feeling, right? And I talk about feelings in my practice a lot. All my clients know. They're like, oh, here she goes again with these feelings. The feelings are really important, right? We all feel something all the time, right? Whether you know what word to associate with that feeling is a skill and a skill to be practiced, right? There's something that you know, your whole audience can look for online. It's either called the feelings wheel or the emotions wheel, but it's just at feeling adjectives that we can use to tell other people how we feel, right? Just implementing that, like letting people know how you feel, like instead of how are you, I'm good. Like that's not, that's not, that tells nothing, that tells us nothing. So it, to, to say like, today I'm feeling lonely. Right now I'm a little frustrated, right? And the yeah. the conversation that that, even that, just doing that opens up, connects us to people in a different way than just like the surface level connection, right? But when we're, when we're one years old, two years old, everybody celebrates first words, right? First sentence right? But nobody actually celebrates or encourages young people to use feeling words. How are you feeling? Right? It doesn't always have to be bad. There are a whole bunch of adjectives that are good feelings too. But that's how you connect with other people. Yeah, because I'm looking at this feeling wheel. I'm like, should I just walk around with a feeling wheel in my pocket? For real? Like, (laughs) (laughs) Bam! Right. Yes, yes. I I tell people, (laughs) I know. I, I encourage people to print it out and put it on your refrigerator, uh, especially people with families, because mm-hmm. when the kids are going from like nine years old to 14, 15, and they're having a lot of trouble with their emotions, mm-hmm. like managing them, a lot of that is because they don't have those feeling words, right? So they bottle it all, all up inside and they get pissed off that nobody understands them. It's partially because they're not communicating how they feel, right? And then we grow up to be these adults who can't communicate the way we feel. So we also show up as like angry or whatever, right? (laughs) Right, It's it's the feelings we is it unlocks so much potential to connect with other human beings, whether it's your kids, your parents, or even your friends. I like that because it's reminding me of uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs of like, do we need to make sure we communicate and the third tier is the love and belonging like are we really communicating so that we can feel loved and belong so for those of you who are new to the show i used to be a teacher for elementary students so this was part of the process (laughs) love it love it i'm all i'm here for it um okay so can you i know before we go further on but i do want to at least bring up the difference. I'm sure people are wondering like, well, what's the difference between a psychotherapist and a psychologist? Can you kind of go a little bit detail about what the difference is? Yeah. Um, There isn't a lot of difference in the practice of a psychologist or a psychotherapist, right? I went to school, I got my master's in social work, clinical social work, right? A psychologist obviously gets a master's in psychology, Right. So it's it's the it's the classes, it's the academics, it's the curriculum that has a little bit of variance. But when it comes to the practice between a psychologist and a psychotherapist, in my case, a social worker, um, what we can offer is very similar. Right. Because we go on. I mentioned earlier, you mentioned all the states that I have licenses in. Which I was like, it just means I have a lot of continued education. <laughs> Um, is that I continue to educate myself in different ways to help my clients. And at the end of the day, the psychologists are doing the same. So we're very similar. It's the psychiatrist that um, that prescribes medication. And so that by function, they are different. But me and a psychologist, we're pretty similar. Okay. So like if they come to you first and then they can go to like a psychologist. Psychiatrist. Psychiatrist to get the medication yeah. that if need. they need it if they mm-hmm. need it okay. and you're actually there to help them out before they need the medication like do you really some people this? some people choose to 
start medication and talk therapy at the same time. Mm. And that's great. Um, other people come to a talk therapist first um, and then to get an idea of maybe what they're dealing with and whether or not they need medication. Not everybody, you know, wants to be on medication or is open to taking medication. So that that's something that we would talk through as well. Like, how do we build that confidence in ourselves before we just go out and say like, you know what, mom, stand on my ground. This is the way it's going to be. And this is the way how you're going to treat me going forward. Yeah. Yeah. Confidence is a tricky one because it is so ingrained in the way you were raised and your childhood experiences, you know, and as, as, as a psychodynamic therapist, I, I really believe in the connection between who we, who we are today and how we were raised and the people that influenced us. It all kind of comes together. Um, for confidence, we have to remember that our feelings and our thoughts are connected and then those, the, the culmination of that will determine our behavior, right? So if I show up or I behave as not confident, it's not because I want to be. It is because my thoughts are um, are dictating how I feel, right? So I, I often tell people, you know, you've got a journal. Journaling isn't a diary. It's, a, it's to reflect on the way you're feeling and what you're thinking. Right. And so if we're really aware of what we're thinking, then we can change that. You can't change the way we feel. Right. Right. I feel what I feel. I feel what I feel when I feel it, period. But, <laughs> but I can change the way I'm thinking. So if I'm thinking, um, if I'm, let's say I walk into a party and I'm feeling insecure, right? Yeah. It's probably because I'm thinking negative, something negative about either the way I look or maybe the the confidence I have in the way I interact with other people. Maybe I'm shy, right? And so I'm walking into the party already thinking I'm shy and the stress is like terrible, right? Of course, I'm not going to come off as confident, right? That's right. True. But But if I change my mindset and I'm like, okay, actually, this stress is everything, <laughs> and I, you know, people like me. I am likable. I'm funny. I'm all the things, right? Then I'm walking and in holding my head high, and I'm going to look more confident. So it's all really connected to what I'm thinking inside. And the only way to really understand that is to journal it or spend some time talking about it. Okay. Yeah. Practice in the dark before you bring it out to the light. I got you. Facts. Yes. Um, because one of the things that we have is anxiety um, coming up when we don't know what to deal with our parents uh, mm -hmm. as we get older. How do we, I mean, because you mentioned communication earlier mm -hmm. and how to actually become better communicators about our feelings. Uh, we talked about communicating of, you know, where they're going to stay. How are you going to continue on to live? But sometimes we just don't know. And how do we kind of quiet down anxiety? I'm not going to say we get rid of it because it can never really get rid of it. But how can we quiet the noise of the unknowns? There are a couple of things. I mean, and for everybody, it's different. But anxiety kind of means we're allowing our brain to be 10, 10 steps ahead of us right? And we're making up the 10 steps, <laughs> like, because we don't know. And it's that unknown that makes you feel so anxious, right? And so the answer is not making it up. <laughs> the answer is not assuming, because most of the time when we assume it's negative, that's right? True. And we don't actually know that that's what's going to happen. So the idea is to reel it back in and stay present, right? And so we talk about pres being present and being mindful, right? The more mindful activities you can do, the better. And it doesn't always have to include a yoga mat and like, you know, a sound bath. Like it doesn't have to be that level. Can be, but it doesn't have to be. Mindfulness can be in the form of like a walk where you're present and you're not on your phone, but you're looking at the birds and the trees and you're, you're really paying attention to what's right in front of you. There's this thing called mindful eating, 
right? And I often describe it as like if you eat an orange to actually be present enough to recognize that that when you pierce the skin of an orange, it kind of makes a little sound, right? If you can be that in tune with that experience, then you know you're completely present. So the more activities you can do in that way, in general, the better, right? The other thing is something we carry with us all the time, and that's breathing, Right? We to have <laughs> to breathe. Thank you. <laughs> Not the iPhone. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, we do have to breathe. <laughs> yes, we do have to breathe. <laughs> and so when you get anxious, the heart rate goes up. Like physiologically, your heart rate goes up. The only way to bring that down is to do some deep breathing. Mm-hmm. Right? So a lot of people roll their eyes when you're like, you have to breathe. It's so true. Physiologically, that is the way to take care of your body. And it's not like, it's, when I'm talking to hyperventilating, like I'm not talking fast breathing, I'm talking slow breathing, right? In and out. I like to count in, in you know terms of eight, like deep, deep inhale for eight counts and out for eight counts. Okay. Not everybody, slow. Yeah. It's, it's really slow, right? Because you have to let it out a little bit at a time. Um, and if your mind is focused on doing that, then it really can't focus on anxious thoughts, right? So for a little while, you get a break and you're really taking the time to get that heart rate down so that you can think. Because with an elevated heart rate, you're using the wrong part of your brain and there's no rational thoughts going on. So we've got to make sure to get that in check. Are you breathing? breathing? Yeah, I was breathing. I was like, <laughs> yeah. all right, let's count eight. It's like, ugh. You're it's probably, harder than it thinks yeah. than you think. <laughs> it's like I do a count in for three, out for three. <laughs> <laughs> That's your challenge for the week. Eight. Yes. I want you to get to eight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I'm going to do a recording on Instagram so y'all can account with me too. So we're going to get it together. Great. All right. All right. Uh, we got the third segment here, which is the features. And this is about you. So what skills or habits that you feel is going to take you to the next level? Hmm. Well, for me, it's about being so I this is my second career. Mm -hmm. Um, I was in corporate America in marketing for a couple of decades. So this for me is my, you know, Danielle 2.0. Love it. Um, so my my version of success, if you will, looks a little bit different, and it looks a lot more like um, like personal joy, right? So I focus a lot on the things that bring me joy, even when I'm looking at like my my own personal finances, right? Of course, you're going to have uh, you know mortgage and and I don't know even gas and all the bills that are like okay I have to do yeah. this <laughs> but, adulting right. yeah all that <laughs> but there's this like notion of like I also need to be happy so even in my personal budget I make sure there are line items of me doing things that bring me joy right because if I'm fulfilled and joyful then I can actually give my clients what they need right if I'm drained then I can't do that so it's about self-care really at the end of the day um, for me and making sure that my priorities line up with my actions. Okay. I like that for you because that's something that a lot of people do forget to do and which is self-care because like you said, you're now rediscovering yourself Mm -hmm. since everybody is out. It's like, yes, gone. What does Danielle want to do? Like, do I want to go? You know, party it up, stay out to nine o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a balance, right? Because there were yeah. things that I liked to do when I was in my 20s before I started having kids. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, mm, I don't really want to do many of those things anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Going to the club is not not the answer. So now I've got to venture out and try new things. Mm. But, you know, I just started boxing. What? Okay. I know. I know. How's that going? Watch out. How's I love going? it. I love it. It's such a release. And it okay. it you have no choice but to be present because you're like literally punching. Right. It's perfect. <laughs> Do you perfect. put like a target up there, like somebody's face and be like, you know what? <laughs> In my head, absolutely. Okay. 
Nice. Uh, I'm not going to tell you. Is, <laughs> I know. So. Hey, okay. you know what? What makes you happy that day? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> personal boxing is personal. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Is there anything that you want to leave the audience before we dive into the final four questions? Yeah, yeah, I do. So when it comes to this taking care of aging parents, I think there are four things that I want everybody to remember. And, um, you know, my, my practice is called Hope Psychotherapy, and I've kind of lived with this foundation of hope. So, of course, I want you to remember it from the acronym HOPE and the, the H to say, stands for um, healing wounds, right? So when we co- when it comes to relationships with our parents, sometimes they can be layered and complicated, right? Yeah. And so it's about having those very honest but open conversations with our parents to heal some of those wounds the way we need them to be healed without criticism or defensiveness, just honest, transparent conversations Right. It goes a long way. And and at their older age, they may be more open to hearing what we actually have to say. Um, so that's the H. The O is for open communication. And I can't stress this more, both with our parents, you know, and but also with our friends and family. Right. We've got to start talking about this stuff more. It's part of our journey. Right. The the P stands for preparedness. Once you start getting that feeling or those thoughts, whether it's with our kids and they're like getting into high school and we're starting to think, oh, like they're they're about to leave. What are the like 102 things I need to teach them before they go? Like once you start getting that feeling, it is time to really start focusing on the journey. But with our parents, it's about being prepared. So financially, there are costs that come with taking care of aging parents that we've got a budget for, but it's also having those conversations with our parents about what their needs are and what their hopes are um, for their last days. So it's a lot of a lot of that. And that needs to happen as soon as you start getting that ick feeling of like something's changing with my mom or my dad. Yeah. Um, and the E is for that emotional acceptance, right? To really... Because this is, I posted something the other day um, that talked about like when we when we have infants and we're exhausted, right? We know that it's going to get better, and that's growth. That means our kids are growing and they're becoming more dependent, independent rather, and everything is good. When we are dealing with the exhaustion that comes with taking care of our parents, what we know is coming is loss, yeah. and with loss comes grief, and that's hard. Right. But we've got to feel what we feel when we feel it. Right. You can't just dismiss those feelings. You really got to lean into them and accept them for what they are and journal. <laughs> so those those are my four. Those are my four tips, if you will. Love it. Yeah, definitely have to make sure that we bring this up uh, in ourselves in our daily communication uh, with everybody. I think that's great. Thank you. Are you ready for the final four questions? <laughs> Absolutely. Alrighty. Number one, what does wealth mean to you? For me, um, wealth is being able to live my life aligned with my actual values um, and priorities without fear, without concern of my own like security and safety. Number two. What was your worst money mistake? I think my worst money mistake is probably, um, and I still struggle with it, to be honest with you. It is trying to do too much at the same time, right? Whether it's spending or paying off debt. It's like, I I tend to, right? If I have like three credit cards, Mm -hmm. I might put like a hundred on each. Right. And and so they're eventually all going down, but really slowly, as opposed to just focusing in on one and getting it done. Yeah. And so it's it's that it's that focus on um mini goals, if you will, mm-hmm. that I struggle with just being able to do that. Yeah, we can uh we can dive into that later. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <Okay. laughs> Number three, 
What is your favorite financial or non-financial book? Okay, so I think I have two. Okay. <laughs> so I cheated. But um, one is uh, Crush Your Money Goals by Bernadette Joy. Mm -hmm. um, because her program, the way she lays it out is so um, simple. But it also has helped me transform my financial habits in a way that feels really good. It, there you go. It's upside yes. down. But yes, okay, there you go. You. Right. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, was, oh, it is upside down. I'm sorry. It is upside down. <laughs> there she goes. There she goes. Um, and then my other one is actually a book that was given to me um, a couple of months ago, ago called Happy Money. Mm -hmm. And it's by Ken, Ho Ken Honda. And in this book, he describes so well the difference between happy money and unhappy money. So what I talked about earlier about like rent, mortgage, all those things, that the adulting expenses, mm -hmm. right? That's the unhappy money, right? But the happy mm -hmm. money is that stuff that brings me joy, the stuff that I can afford to do and put in my budget that brings me joy and fulfillment as a human. And so, so I can't lose can't lose that uh, connection to the happy money as well. Love it. Yeah, I might the um because I gave I do book giveaways just about every quarter. And so Bernadette Joy's book was recent. That's why I had a book. I uh, love it. And but happy money, I would definitely look into giving that book away as well. It looks really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Good. All right, number four. What is your favorite dish to make? Okay, so kind of no surprise here. So <laughs> the, the no surprise part is the why. So I have to say, I love to bake, but when we talk about food, food, my favorite dish to make is lasagna. Mm. And yes, I love Italian food, but it's mostly because of the process, mm. right? It takes time to layer everything together. Mm -hmm. And it's just the process that is mindful. Right. I kind of have to focus and do it right. I, I do tend to go heavy on the meat, lower on the cheese, but that's OK. <laughs> you do you. Right. Um, but I, 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 I enjoy the process, which is probably why I enjoy baking, too. It's the, the measuring and the putting together. Awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I have to try that, uh, that lasagna out one day. You're like, hey, yeah, yeah. I, I, I got an empty stomach. <laughs> I know. I made you a little something. Right. <laughs> That's some self care that need that. <laughs> self care lasagna. I love it. It's a thing. Lasagna. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the last question of the show, which is where can we find out more about you? Sure. So I have a website. It's called um, myhopestation.com. Um, and my clinical practice is on there, but we also have events and workshops um, that I promote there. You can also sign up for my newsletter on that website. Um, I have a biweekly newsletter that has, um, it has things for couples. It has things for um, individuals and uh, a review of like journal prompts. A lot of people don't journal because they're like, I don't know what to write. So I, I help with that as well. And then on my Instagram, which is, at my hope station as well is at every Thursday I do, I give you a journal prompt to just help you out a little bit to get through proper reflection on some key topics. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, Danielle. I greatly Thank appreciating you. learning all of the things that you have going on. And, okay. you know, I'm sorry, they didn't even do your proper title, Dr. Danielle. <laughs> That's okay. That's um, and, you know, I appreciate everything that you're doing for not just for your clients, but also for the community and continuously bringing on new ways to kind of help us build confidence, not just our money, but beyond in our self-care. So I just want to say thank you. you. Thank you. And this for the audience, for you guys are listening. If you got anything wonderful out of this particular episode please make sure you go ahead on and like subscribe share on all of your social media platforms and if you're brand new to the show again i just want to say thank you and go ahead on and subscribe and you can also subscribe to my newsletter at aboutthatwallet.com forward slash newsletter all right everybody yep